good. So you should be able to see the slides. <clears throat> okay. Um, The first thing that I want to talk about are the exam details. Um, so the exam will last exactly for the amount of time that we usually have for the lecture, which is 90 minutes. So from 1.15 p.m. to 2.45 um, p.m. Uh, next Thursday. Um, what you will get is there's a Moodle uh, and there's an exam page that's extra for the Moodle. Some of you uh, have already seen have successfully signed up uh, for this exam Moodle page. Um, and what I will do is there will be a Word file um, and I will upload that Word file and you can then download it uh, as soon as the exam starts. And there are questions and I've provided like text boxes. So uh, you can write your text into those text boxes. And if you need more space, obviously you're free to <laughs> expand the text boxes. Um, but I hope that the space will, will suffice. Um, it's a mix of multiple choice and mostly text-based answers and questions. And there will also be visual material um, that you will encounter and that we will have uh, already discussed in the lecture. So um, these are usually the images that we have discussed and that you have already seen uh, in the lecture. Um, there will be 10 questions. Um, some questions might have sub points. So there would be like um, a big question and two sub questions. And so you answer the two sub questions um, and you would get like five points for each sub questions. But usually the questions are just like one big question and then you write down your text. And um, yeah, and then, um, yeah, usually there would be like just big questions and then uh, you will write down the the answers to those questions and you will receive uh, 10 points uh, for each question. So there will be 10 questions uh, for 10 points. Sorry, um, my phone was just doing weird stuff. Good. Um, According um, to the grade scale, uh, these will be the uh, grades that you can receive if uh, you are moving between the percentages that you can find on the slide. So everything that's 50% and lower, unfortunately, has to be uh, a fail. 60%, um, uh, so 51% to 60% is going to be a four, which in the Austrian system is a sort of pass, but barely pass. <laughs> um, the third one uh, is called Befriedigend. It's from 61% to 75%. Uh, and that's like uh, a sufficient um, performance. And then the two is from 76% to 90%. That's a good. And then uh, the one is a very good. And that's from 91% to 100%. So. As you see from uh, the grade scale, you will have to answer nine out of 10 questions completely um, and to get the whole uh, points in order to get a one or maybe um, the other way around, you answer all the questions, but then like with some of the questions, you might have like some point deductions and then you could still also receive a one. Uh, if you answer like barely any questions, um, then you will probably fail. But as long as you write answers to each of the questions, even if like maybe you miss some details or so, I think uh, you should be able to pass, uh, pass the exam. Okay. Um, just one second, please, before we continue.
Okay, sorry. Uh, urgent uh, matter. Good. Um, so this is the grade scale. And as I've said, um, there will be 10 questions with each 10 points. So that's the basic structure of the exam. Are there any questions about the basic structure of the exam or how it will work? Uh, I should probably also mention that um, when you fill out the, uh, your answers in the text boxes in the Word document, the idea is that you also upload it before the official exam time ends. So it's not that you can write down your answers until 2.45 and then uh, you know, start this sort of um, uploading procedure, uh, you will have to do it already in, in that time frame. Uh, if you experience difficulties, I think it even says so on the uh, exam Moodle page, uh, there's a person that you can call who will actually help us out with like technical um, problems. Okay, so if you uh, have a technical problem, that's not the end of the world, uh, we will find a solution for it. Okay. But I'm trying to make it as easy as possible. So it's just a Word document that you will have to download. Um, and I hope that all of you have uh, either like OpenOffice or Microsoft Word or something with which you can open that file. Um, and I see there's a question. <laughs> um, can we answer the questions in German? Yeah. Yeah, why not? Um, I mean, if like, I would encourage you to do it in English, but like if you can't find the words or like, you know, you feel stressed and like, there's no possibility for you to like, you know, look these things up or so, um, you can also just write down some of them in German. The same goes for French speakers then, to be fair. Um, <laughs> So uh, if, if, if there's something that you can't think of in, um, in English, then you can write it down in French. Um, but again, I encourage you to try to do uh, most of the questions in English. And then if, you've, you know, if there are some phrases or sentences uh, or words, um, then you can um, write them in, your, in, in French or in, or in German as well. Um, I'm probably a bit better in German than I'm in French, but <laughs> I'm able to read French, so no problem. Um, so definitely, yeah, uh, multilingualism is encouraged <laughs> um, and uh, you can definitely uh, resort back to your uh, native uh, language if it's German or French in order to answer some of the questions. So this will not influence your grade, okay? Good, um, the rest of the session. So um, the first half will be like a quick uh, tour through the lecture contents. And um, the second half will be a Q&A on lecture contents and the exam. And that part will be unrecorded. So I will stop the recording uh, before we move on to that so that it's a bit more informal and you can feel free to ask uh, the questions. Okay, so we will go through this uh, session by session. And as you can imagine, uh, we've had a couple of sessions. So I'm trying to uh, give you the possibility to answer questions from each of those lectures uh, and not have 10 questions from just one lecture uh, of the entire lecture series. So, um, you know, it's good if you have an overview of, of all the content uh, that we um, engaged in together. So the first session was on the history of the anthropology of art, part one, which where we discussed really the sort of early approaches to art and whether there were any early <laughs> approaches to art. Um, we looked at this sort of very early museum design, the Pitt Rivers Museum, as you uh, might still remember. We did an, a virtual tour there and we also explored some of the cabinets. Um, and we've also discussed the fact that in very early anthropology, art and material culture wasn't really studied in its own, right? It was always part of like a bigger holistic study. Um, sometimes like art or material culture had to have a function and it was never studied sort of, you know, um, for itself as a subject matter. That was a bit different uh, in the American uh, anthropology. Uh, that's because of the four field approach, right? So you already had these sort of um, different um, anthropological subfields a bit and um, for instance Boas himself, Franz Boas, um, wrote this uh, landmark essay, uh, Primitive Art, which we 
also discussed uh, in the second in the second session. Um, and there was also um, and some authors also focused on the anthropology of art uh, in disguise or what I call in disguise, right? So like they weren't necessarily really focusing on like aesthetic or contextual dimensions of, of art objects, but they were actually at the center of what they did. So for instance, if we think about the Kula exchange, it's all about objects. It's all about the physical and the aesthetic properties uh, of the objects of the Kula exchange, right? Um, all the stuff that Maus talks about uh, in his book, The Gift, um, it's also about these material dimensions, right? So um, even if like art wasn't studied in, in its own, there was still um, some preoccupation with material culture going on, even in these very early um, studies on uh, in anthropology. In the second session, uh, we continued with the history of this subdiscipline and we looked at um, Sort of more like the latter half of the 20th century which was really the point in time when like the anthropology of art became established as sort of like a sub-discipline that had to do obviously with the development of other sub-disciplines and the fact that anthropology really like spread out into all different kinds of directions and that the, and that there were also interdisciplinary debates going on right like debates between art historians and art anthropologists and like the same of course goes for like economics and, and all these um, sub-disciplines. Um, especially from the 1970s on, we then have this sort of emergence of visual and symbolic anthropology uh, and also a focus on theories of the body and gender and so on. And all that, you know, helped uh, in a way to also uh, lay the foundation for the anthropology of art because uh, more interpretive um, and more experimental approaches were starting to be becoming sort of like the main, like more moving more into the mainstream um, of anthropology. Uh, in that second session, we also discussed what uh, an anthropological definition of art can look like, uh, whether it's different to, um, to other um, definitions. And what we, de uh, what we said was that it's, um, it's highly contextual. So um, I mean, that's, of course, also the case for art history, but in anthropology, it's really um, a combination of like the context um, of the art that we study. So the context can be like production, circulation, consumption, but it can also be the ethnographic context, right? So um, we might approach the study of art differently if the society in which we study that art uh, may or may not have um, a definition of art um, or may or may not make distinctions between art and material culture or might have their very own ideas about what um, art is. Uh, and the same goes, of course, for distinctions between sort of high and low culture. So, for instance, in the West, there's this idea, right, that uh, there is certain forms of high culture and certain forms of low culture. Um, although, uh, of course, voices of, of from within have also critiqued it and said that this is an arbitrary distinction that doesn't make sense and can definitely not be applied to uh, other parts of the world. Um, nevertheless, even in the anthropology of art, we're of course influenced uh, by globalized ideas on art uh, that concerns theories, it concerns concepts, it concerns our methodologies. And um, so it's always good to be aware of the fact that we do have a sort of very Western based uh, still nevertheless Western-based uh, sort of approach uh, to the study of art. And um, also when we discussed some of the lecture contents, we saw that a very sort of, for instance, very early um, American anthropologists were highly influenced by like Western uh, European discourses on art that were going on at the same time and there was an exchange, right? And only later was this sort of, you know, opening up and thinking about what do other societies think about art? What are their approaches? What are their concepts? What are their theories? Um, Morphy and Perkins also say the anthropology of art includes the very debate on what art is. And so it's definitely good um, to uh, have the anthropology of art and think about art in an anthropological manner, even if there's no really clear one definition of what art uh, is in an anthropological context because it doesn't need to be because it always depends on the ethnographic context. Uh, yeah, if you have 
questions after each of the sessions, of course, you can um, directly type them into the chat or raise your hand. Um, otherwise, I'll just continue and we can also, of course, uh, do the questions then later as well. I should probably also say as a disclaimer, um, I'm giving you an overview here, but it doesn't mean that the exam content uh, contents would only be drawn from this one presentation, right? <laughs> For Otherwise, why would we have the lecture and why would we go into detail on each of these topics, right? So this is really just to give you um, a few big takeaway ideas, uh, what, the what the lecture contents were generally about um, and to recall that into your uh, mind for your rehearsal then uh, when you look into each of those uh, lecture contents, right? But as I've said, I'm not giving like super detailed questions either. Like I'm not asking you about, um, I don't know, from when to when like a certain anthropologist lived or so. Um, but what you should be able to know is sort of, you know, which century <laughs> possibly, uh, that would be great. But other than that, uh, there's, uh, there's not sort of this like very neat, neat picking detaily um, questions that I'm interested in. Good. Continuing, uh, we also discussed in uh, these first two sessions a, a few examples already of what um, art can be in an anthropological viewpoint. Um, uh, as you see, we have here uh, the war god the statue from the Sunni, which we talked about, which traveled through the museums and there were repatriation claims going on. Uh, so that was quite an ex important example, which we also um, revisited again uh, in the very last session on repatriation. Um, there's a wood bark painting um, and face painting by the Yonyu in Australia. We looked at the Chinese literati paintings. Um, to discuss uh, the fact that anthropologists look at very, very different forms of art. So an anthropologist can also, of course, look at a Rembrandt, um, but definitely uh, all parts of the world uh, and all types of material culture. We also discussed sort of like what can be art again in uh, Alfred Schell Art and Agency in that session where we also said it really depends on the context. But these were the examples that we discussed in terms of like the varying and vastly different context in which art becomes produced and consumed and circulated. If it even can be circulated because face paintings, um, like images can be circulated, but, uh, and also for instance, with the Sunni statues, we also said they should actually not be removed, right, <laughs> from their places. Uh, so again, it, they complicate this idea of like, every art can be globally circulated. In the third session, we then said, okay, now we had this overview and we will move back right to the beginnings of the anthropology of art and look at one of the earliest proponents, which was Franz Boas in his essay uh, on primitive art. So for the exam, of course, it would be good to know who is Franz Boas um, and what culture did he write about, which are the Haida, right? So um, we watched this video um, where the Haida spoke about the history in their own words. Um, we discussed the fact that the Pitt Rivers Museum that we visited in the first session has a totem pole from the Haida uh, and also how that uh, totem pole traveled to the Pitt Rivers. And then we looked at um, the ways in which uh, Haida art is still alive today. And the reason that I did that is um, because usually when students read like the very early studies uh, in anthropology, um, they are often written in such a sort of ahistorical way that it becomes unclear. And sometimes they were written so early that it becomes unclear um, how the story continued and what happened afterwards. And, um, you know, to sort of break out of this sort of ahistoricity, um, we also discussed uh, the situation of the Haida today, um, a bit of the history, obviously, and then also um, forms of art production that they did today. So it's definitely good to remember maybe some of the contemporary stuff that they do as well, right? And we talked about, um, for instance, totem pole carving, which lives up till this day. We talked about, um, you know, statues, wood carving, masks. We even talked about mangas. So there are artists who, um, you know, um, use sort of the aestheticism uh, of Haida art and merge it together with the Japanese manga. Um, and if we remember then um, when the artist was asked why he does that and why not like maybe cartoons or so, he said because he didn't want to engage in that sort of Western 
form of the cartoon and would rather engage with the Japanese form of the manga. Uh, and then we also even watched a uh, trailer uh, of a movie that was run in the cinemas, um, which was in the uh, actual language of the Haida. So like the actors had to, uh, some of the actors already spoke Haida, but very few do, um, do speak the Haida language. And so um, some of them had to learn it and there was a consultation process going on. So also highly interesting. Yeah, so um, this is really then giving you sort of uh, from the very early study of the anthropology of art right into the contemporary and idea of um, what is being done. There was also some visual material that I've provided. So obviously a map of where <laughs> um, the Haida are. Um, many of them are in Haida Gwai, but of course they're also dispersed across the coast. Um, this one here, the figure 1.5, this is an example of uh, Boas's essay. Um, here we have some examples of contemporary wood carving, the eagle on the tortoise, um, or no, probably, well, could be raven or eagle, I can't remember anymore, but that's a level of detail again. Uh, you have to look up in uh, the lecture lectures itself. Um, and then there are masks and the mangas, right? So like the takeaway point is there is contemporary forms of Haida production. And if you're able to mention one of them uh, and explain one of them, that would be great. And obviously this one is not <laughs> contemporary. This is just from Boas. Good. Um, then after that, uh, we moved on a bit further in time uh, and stopped at the debate on primitivism. And we started that session um, by looking at these two images, one by Paul Klee and the other one, a war god statue of the Sunni, um, to discuss the similarities between those. Um, and I then told you about the story about how apparently Paul Klee uh, was inspired by um, this quote unquote primitive art, right? And what, and then we discussed what primitivism is and the fact that a lot of like modern European painters took their inspiration um, from different parts of the world and the art uh, of uh, non-Western cultures, uh, but in a way that also appropriated it. And a lot of the exhibitions that we discussed um, actually, um, didn't really critically look at that, right? So they uh, they said the art is the modern Western European art, uh, but the inspiration inspirations came from there, right? But it was never like a sort of um, unequal footing, so to say. Um, so for the precise critiques, again, I would recommend that you uh, look at the lecture uh, and that you also really remember the two exhibitions. So first of course, uh, what is primitivism in this modern art movement? that took reference uh, to the art of the quote unquote other. Um, and then the two exhibitions that dealt with that, um, the first one, uh, which received quite a lot of critiques and the second one, which tried to make things better, but then again, received a lot of critiques. Um, and for the exam, it would be good to, uh, to you know, remember the, the broad aims of both of those exhibitions and the critiques uh, on the exhibition. So to go back to the lecture videos and have a look at that. Uh, we also discussed a lot of visual material. Um, so here you see, for instance, Picasso and the Marcel d'Avignon, where he appropriated sort of uh, masks, um, which you can see in some of the faces. Um, there's also like uh, an image that was a painting by um, Paul Gauguin, uh, which we also discussed, sort of his fascination with the exotic. Um, and we also discussed um, how this sort of exoticism lives on uh, in today's culture industry. So for instance, in this blockbuster avatar, you have a lot of these uh, traits that are considered as exotic um, that re-narrates in a way like also the story of colonialism, just that it's on another planet and in the future. But in the end, it, it resembles in a way uh, some of the debates that we've, uh, we've discussed and so uh, there's a lot of things that are to be seen critically uh, with like modern Hollywood adaptations, uh, even if they try to like, you know, re, re sort of this history uh, of colonial oppression, they do it while still exoticizing, um, like even an imaginary <laughs> uh, a group of people like um, here in Avatar. 
Um, the other thing that you can see in the corner, uh, if we didn't tell you it came from the Suina marine forest, you think it was modern art. Um, so this uh, um, page of a magazine refers to the fact that um, modern art is appropriated so heavily um, from like the stylistic and aesthetic dimensions um, of non-Western art that uh, it like that there wouldn't even be any differences that you could actually uh, see if you were not an expert uh, in uh, in any of those um, art movements. So um, again, this sort of tells us about this very, very close connection and the uh, degree of appropriation that has happened um, in sort of primitivism. the fifth and sixth lecture then, um, we talked about methods. Uh, as you can see, we used two um, <laughs> lectures for this. So as you might, uh, I mean, if you can make an inference to the exam, that would probably mean that it does have some sort of like um, relevance to the exam as well. Um, and we talked about uh, first, the first part of the, uh, or the first lecture was um, on ethnographic fieldwork itself. So uh, the spectrum from observation to participation, some people observe more, some participate more, but the idea is that you do both. We talked about grounded theory as a way of analyzing. Um, and we also talked about different forms of interviews uh, that anthropologists obviously can also look at the social media, at media articles and things like that. Then we went specifically into art anthropological fieldwork and we talked about how um, anthropologists of art usually combine methods, right? So they would, they would draw on, of course, ethnographic fieldwork. The idea is that you go out, uh, you know, and talk to artists and um, observe them, participate um, in the art world and things like that. But then also usually anthropologists of art have to have some repertoire of knowledge about the analysis of art itself, right? And here, this sort of object-oriented analysis usually um, draws from methods of the uh, of art history and um, definitely is a combination of formal and contextual analysis. And we also discussed what this sort of formal and contextual analysis uh, looks like. Um, formal analysis, as we've said, concerns sort of like the formal properties of an artwork. So for instance, um, the linearity, the color, the scale, the mass, dark versus light, dimensionality, you know, how much room does an artwork take up in a space and things like that. Contextual analysis then means um, that you look at artworks in a specific context. So it's important uh, to look at um, when and where and how was the artwork produced and what does it mean and what does the artist say and what does the curator say and things like this. But artworks can also be a context, right? So um, it's both artworks that are in a context and artworks that can function as a context. Um, as part of this sort of contextual analysis, we've talked about iconography and iconology and a bit of the sort of art historical background, just so that we have an idea about that. Um, iconography and iconology has three stages, we said, there's a pre-iconology phase and then two more phases uh, of analysis and um, that was a uh, concept um, developed by Erwin Panofsky, who was one of the most important art historians. Good. Uh, but what happened, happened up after Panofsky, we said there's a couple of uh, things um, that, of course, moved uh, the study of art in its methodological dimensions even further. Um, this concerns, for instance, semiotics, um, and we discussed the text by Bell Hooks, which discussed sort of the color red um, as a meaning maker and a symbol for certain things uh, in, in the society in which she grew up. Um, and then, of course, there's other methods such as artistic research, collaborations between artists and ethnographers, um, and of course, Hal Foster's um, very important essay on the artist as ethnographer, which sort of talks about this ethnographic turn in the arts. What do I mean by that? That more and more artists and cultural practitioners turned to the methods of anthropology um, 
and also wanted to do ethnographic research themselves or thought that they could even do it better because anthropology obviously had uh, some flaws and still has some flaws as a discipline. And so there's always this critical approach from the arts who say some of the methodologies are good, but uh, together coupled with the arts or from an artistic perspective, it becomes even better. And then in turn, there's also a sensory turn in anthropology, which means that anthropologists started to look at um, artistic research practices and practices that are usually um, less prevalent in mainstream anthropology, for instance, everything that has to do with the senses, right? So like um, dance as a methodology, um, listening as a methodology, feeling as a methodology and so on. Um, so if you're interested in that, um, one of the main proponents was Sarah Pink uh, in terms of sort of what a sensory anthropology uh, can entail. We also uh, went through a lot of visual material here. Um, so uh, these things, I, I don't know if you see my mouse when I do stuff, um, but like on the upper left, you have like this distinction um, in terms of a formal element. So, um, images that can be, or paintings that can be more linear, linear and others who, that can be more painterly, um, some things that can be more abstract and other things that can be more figurative. And then we had a couple of um, artworks, uh, performances and objects that we talked about in which uh, we discussed uh, formal and contextual analysis um, the importance of knowing the context, um, performance art, and things like that. So in terms of the exam, um, what I will do is I will not, um, I will not ask you about like, uh, um, oh, let's put it like that. There will be, there will be two questions uh, or two approaches when, uh, to the exam when I ask you um, to talk about methods in the exam. The first one is that there will be some sort of visual material uh, and I will ask you um, to look at that material uh, and to analyze it according uh, to the methods that we've learned. The other part is um, something where I want you um, to be creative uh, and to think a little bit um, out of the box. So for instance, I could give you a scenario um, and then ask you to give me a very short sketch of how you, as an anthropologist of art, would approach your fieldwork. Um, so I talked a bit about my own fieldwork, so I take that as an example, because obviously that will not then be an example at the exam. Um, and so my own research project was um, that I was interested in the interrelationship between uh, national narratives propagated by the state and um, artistic reactions to that, which meant uh, for my research design that I had to think about how do I look at what the state narratives are. And I decided that there would be heritage festivals that I could go through and that I could look at and all the other sort of exhibitions where the state intervened. Um, and then in terms of working with artists, I decided that it would be good to join an art school um, and to work with our artists directly. Or I went to galleries and I did interviews with a gallery. I went to art auctions. So there's lots of different things that you can do as an art anthropologist. Um, and here, I think it would also be good when you answer these questions in the exam to draw on the lecture of art worlds, because that's where we also discussed like all these different parts of the art worlds and how um, and all the venues, because these are, of course, all potential venues that then uh, anthropologists of art uh, can look at. OK, so um, it's less uh, sort of um, the, the questions about methods are less about what is method X. <laughs> Um, and more that the first question will provide you with visual material where you will, um, you know, use some of this sort of formal and contextual analysis and then the second sort of um, being more imaginative and creative about designing your own little research project. And there will be, of course, um, enough information for you to do that. Good. Um, then uh, after the methods, we moved on um, to Alfred Gell and the Agency of Art. Um, and we discussed uh, his book, Art and Agency and Anthropological Theory. So it would be good to know uh, what Alfred Gell's main proposition was. So like, what does this book really argue? <laughs> um, 
that's of course easy because it's that art has agency. <laughs> um, but we will get a bit more detailed uh, rather than remaining at, uh, at this sort of superficial level, right? So like he says, anthropology of art should always take place in a social relational matrix in which art is embedded. We talked about this fact that for gel, it's really, anthropology is really a social science discipline. It is all about the relations between artworks and people or artworks and artworks, and it's never just the object alone. Um, but again, like other art anthropologists might have different opinions, right? So <laughs> this is just one. Um, and he also proposes to treat art as a system of action intended to change the world rather than encode symbolic propositions about it. Um, so for him, anything can be an art object uh, from the anthropological point of view. And that's why he discusses all these different examples from cars to Barbie dolls to um, you know, conceptual art and so on. Um, he then goes on to define sort of the role of a social agent, because obviously if it's about agency, we have to talk about agents. Uh, and he says there's um, sort of primary and secondary agents. So, uh, but usually social agents are a person or a thing that is seen as initiating causal consequences of a particular type. So they're doing something, right? Um, and he then goes even further into sort of discussing this, his theory of the art nexus. And we had this very complicated table <laughs> um, where you could also see all these elements at play with each other. Um, it would be good to know, uh, except for the fact of who's Arpachel, what is the main takeaway of the book, um, to also know the parts of the theory of the art nexus. So there's an index, there's primary agents, secondary agents, there's patients. Um, and then um, in his sort of uh, table, uh, he had uh, the artist, the prototype, the index, and the recipient. So um, I won't ask you to, you know, recount the whole theory to me. But it would be good if you, you know, uh, know one or two aspects that you could explain in a bit more detail. Okay, so for instance, like the agent and the patient, or um, what's the prototype, or what is an index, um, so that you at least know, you know, roughly what these things are. Um, yeah, and then there was a critique, of course, uh, on his work as well. And one of those was that the distinction between the primary and secondary agents devalues the importance of secondary agents, namely the objects. Like what's the point of um, doing a theory of agency if you then say that, you know, uh, objects are only secondary agents and they don't really have that much agency as a person. Um, so yeah, so that was of course uh, one critique, but that doesn't devalue the whole uh, theory itself. We also had some visual material here. So like one thing that <laughs> was really, um, or it's really easy to remember is his story about the car that he had owned this Toyota and that like if that car would break down in the middle of the night he would consider it as an act of gross treachery because how dare the car break down on him uh, as if the car was a social agent and was you know uh, sort of kicking up a fuss out of intention. Um, so that's one of the examples he uses. Um, then here on the right side we see an example um, of a statue and he uses um, for instance statues to say um, that here the artwork draws on a specific prototype and who's the prototype the prototype is Stalin so like the statue is not Stalin right because Stalin is dead and he was a human um, but that th that Stalin served as a prototype for instance right uh, for this statue um, and then also in terms of discussing what art is and what isn't. He talks about like, um, you know, sort of um, Duchamp's um, snow shovel. Um, and here again, like the question is, what is an art object? Uh, is this an object because it's placed into the exhibition context or not? And he says um, his open, you know, approach to art uh, is justified also because of these things, right? Because of <laughs> because of conceptual art, because of the fact that people bring found objects and then make them or turn them into an art object. So um, this is also something that we've quickly discussed. So yeah, in terms of like um, the 
the theory of the art nexus, it would be good to know what its, you know, uh, contents are in terms of like these parts, these different parts like agent, patient, and so on, and then to be able to explain one of them um, or two of them in, in the exam in a bit more detail. Then in the eighth session, we turned to art worlds and um, we first of course discussed the term art worlds itself. Um, we talked a bit about the difference between art worlds and art markets, um, the fact that primary and secondary markets exist, and that there's a difference between them. Um, and then we went each by each into different institutions of the art world and the art markets, so including art schools, auction houses, art fairs, biennials, galleries, the media, the artist studio, art advisors. Um, so again, as I've said, uh, in terms of like when I give you a scenario to think about creatively in the exam, um, you can also, of course, draw on these institutions and say you would be doing field work in one of those institutions and what that would look like or so. Yeah. Um, and we've also discussed the fact that um, that this that it's somehow a bit complicated, um, but that like some of these institutions are part of an art world. And some are part of an art market and some are part of both. Right. So you could, for instance, say, an, uh, I don't know, like a specific um, institution is part of the art world and not necessarily the market because, you know, you can't really see how like that institution would be monetized, right? Like biennials, for instance, are not for profit. Art schools are usually not for profit. Um, the artist studio is just a place of creation, isn't it? But um, in a way, of course, they do belong also somehow to the art market. So like, um, it's always good to be aware of the fact that like these clear boundaries do not necessarily exist, uh, even if one belongs maybe more closely to an art world rather than an art market. But the art market could not exist if there were no artist studios. <laughs> um, so much about that. And again, we've discussed some visual material. So the first two here, Chris Ophelis, um, Mary and the shark are both of, uh, so from Chris Ophelis and then from Damon Huss. And they both belong to this group called the Young British Artists, where we discussed in the lecture um, how important the networks are for artists that they forge uh, during art school. Um, and that these really matters, you know, sort of for the later success of an artist as well. Um, here again, we have sort of a uh, typical example of found art, the Brilli Brillo boxes by Warhol, where um, he've just placed cardboard boxes uh, into a gallery and called it art, right? So at that point in time, that was very um, extravagant and, and uh, provocative. Um, in the lower left, uh, we have an image uh, of an art school, an art crit session where, people, where artists discuss their work together. Uh, which is sort of like a formative experience for artists. And then here we can see an auction at Christie's um, where we have uh, people who bid for other people over the phone or over the internet. Um, so there's different forms of bidding as well. And then here um, the big image is uh, from an art fair, which belongs to the primary market. Um, and then we've also discussed biennials and art forums. So biennials are not for profit. We talked about sort of this blueprint template of these world fairs that happened back in the day and how then from then on sort of like the Venice Biennial was created and then also other globalized uh, global versions uh, of, of biennials um, started to um, pop up. Uh, so you have biennials in all different parts of the world. Uh, the one unifying character is that they're not for profit, but in the beginning that wasn't the case, right? Like at the beginning there was actually um, the possibility to even buy art at the Venice Biennial, but that stopped. And now the pavilions um, or the biennials are always funded by states usually, or by not-for-profit organizations or um, other things. But there's not this market um, element where you can buy and sell at this institution. That's what the art fair is for. Good, and then in the last session that was last week, we discussed Marxist, feminist, and post or decolonial approaches to art. And so in terms of Marxism, we quickly went through sort of like early studies, <laughs> what is Marxism, Marx, Engels, and then we discussed a bit the prison notebooks and sort of Gramsci and this idea of cultural hegemony 
um, and then on to Lukas, who was one of like the Marxist, you know, um, most important uh, Marxist authors on art. And then we quickly moved on to discuss the Frankfurt School, Adorno, Hoakama, Benjamin, and his essay, um, The Artwork in the Age of Reproduction. Um, and then a couple of other authors who, um, who did studies in sort of a Marxist way or with a Marxist background. And at each of these sessions, so the Marxist feminist and post-colonial approaches, we always ask ourselves, so what does a study look like if it would be approached from a Marxist viewpoint? And so here we said, um, usually Marxist art historians or art anthropologists would look at the role of patrons, of socioeconomic status, of ideology, social economic power. So, I mean, obviously it doesn't mean that they will only look at that, but um, these things will play an emphasized role. Let's put it like that. And here are a couple of the examples that we've discussed. So the books that we've shortly discussed, so for instance, Rembrandt's uh, Enterprise, um, by Svetlana Alpas, where you know she uh, discussed Rembrandt as an ent entrepreneur, basically, and not as an artist. Um, and again, this stirred a lot of debate in art history because there was still this idea going on about the artist as genius and like not reliant on the work of others, which clearly isn't true in the case of Rembrandt and a lot of contemporary artists today who have people who create artworks for them, right? So that's also why you often have an art history, these debates about, is this really a Rembrandt or is it not? Or is this really a so-and-so or is it not? Um, because usually not all art is always produced by just like one person. We've also discussed um, a mural by Judith Barker, um, which discusses a uh, um, neighborhood uh, and sort of the um, uprooting of a neighborhood by projects in which like white suburbans would commute more uh, or better uh, in what was it LA or San Francisco I think LA um, and sort of you can see sort of some aspects of, of the debates and the clashes that have happened um, and we've also discussed the form of the mural so why is it a mural why is it public you know public art why did she decide to go for that and we've also discussed a bit sort of how she connects to sort of like the Latin American tradition of muralism as well. Feminist approaches then, um, we talked about early um, approaches and then of course the second sex uh, and feminist mystique. Um, so by De Beauvoir and Betty Friedan uh, respectively. And then of course there was this like seminal essay in art history by Linda Nochlin, why have there been no great women artists? Um, then um, after that sort of, you know, fundamental essay, um, art historians started to think more about the role of women, uh, both in art, but also in the discipline of art history itself. Um, so what role um, do women play? What sort of art has been looked at? And here also, of course, there's an intersectional analysis, for instance, by Alice Walker, who says that, for instance, a lot of, um, of the art by um, Black female artists in the US um, has been disregarded uh, in the favor of, for instance, um, Black male artists, uh, because the art that they have produced was not formally recognized in the sort of art historical canon, for instance, gardening, um, pottery, embroidery, and all these things, right? Um, so they also definitely need to be looked at um, in order to really um, get a holistic image. Um, we've also discussed this one forgotten Renaissance artist, Artemisia Gentileschi, um, and then there have also been books that have been written about her, and then of course intersectional and queer approaches, um, and then again the questions that you would ask from sort of a feminist viewpoint, um, the training of female artists, subjects of the painting, audience bias, and how did a patriarchal art world respond, or like an art market that is structured by like ideas of patriarchy. Uh, and of course, intersectional analysis. And we've had some images here as well. So like the left one on the top is of course by Artemisia Gentileschi, um, the, the slaying of, um, what's his name? I'm really bad with like Christian themes, um, but Judith and Holofernes um, something. Anyway, uh, that's not so important, <laughs> um, but it's just here so that you know there was this, you know, if, if I ask you in the exam to explain like one of those approaches or so, you know, that you have an idea of what like each of those approaches entail basically. 
Um, good. And then, of course, uh, also we talked about a mask uh, from the Mende people from Sierra Leone, which um, where the patrons are women and the people who wear them are women, but they're produced by men, for instance, right? So like to think about the gender dimensions of artworks in different uh, cultures around the world. Yeah, and lastly, we talked about post and decolonial approaches. We talked shortly about the difference between post and decolonial and like the critiques of decolonial scholars on like this idea of post colonialism and that it would sort of entrench um, in a way like a colonialist viewpoints, but also sort of um, puts forward this idea that it's post, so that it's over and that there are no neo colonial entanglements of power. Um, that consist until the state, which are propagated by the World Bank and the IMF and so on, right? So like decolonial scholars say, um, we need to decolonize, uh, not post-colonize. It's not over, the, it's an ongoing project, right? And in this vein of um, decolonization debates, there's also this restitution debate going on, right? There was this big um, report that was commissioned um, by the French president, um, which was written by Felvin Sarr and Benedict Savoy, um, two scholars who um, both have worked in different aspects of, of um, the repatriation of non-Western art that is placed in Western museums. And they found that a majority of that actually needs to be repatriated, right? Uh, and was unlawfully acquired. And even if like there was like a sort of quote unquote legal transaction, usually there was a huge information uh, asymmetry going on. And so like these were not lawfully acquired objects um, and they house so many of them that they can't even exhibit them. So like, you know, what's the point of letting them rot in a European cellar? Um, so there's this whole debate going on uh, and also about, of course, the venues um, where they would be exhibited in the future, how a repatriation process can work um, and so what it all entails. Um, but basically for the exam, again, it's important to understand sort of this difference post decolonial, um, maybe some scholars and of course this idea about the restitution debates, what does it entail, how was it sparked, um, what are the recent debates um, that are going on in this respect. Good. And this is the part where uh, we stop the presentation and move on to the questions part.